to the extent we can, members. Uh, this is uh, an informational hearing. Uh, officially, we're not organized under this uh, current session, uh, being we're out of the regular session, but we can hold informational hearings and uh, do uh, similar to committee work, uh, do, do, what, do what we are skilled at doing and uh, routinely do. Um, and so, uh, welcome. Uh, hope everybody had a great 4th of July. Uh, enjoyed the weather, enjoy family, friends, and uh, being in the outdoors. And uh, what, what Minnesota has is uh, sometimes a shorter summer than we like, but it's been a uh, been a nice, uh, nice weekend. So I hope you had had a good time doing what you enjoyed. We're getting a million dollar rain uh, up here where I'm at right now, and uh, I think a lot of the state is. So that's that's helpful. Hopefully, it's more than less. But uh, um, with that, members, um, what we're here for today is to uh, do uh, uh, get to know uh, Dean Compart more, a little better as. Um, one of the governor's appointees to the Board of Animal Health, uh, not a stranger to the Board of Animal Health, uh, nor a stranger to livestock, uh, has a, a long resume, a strong resume uh, for livestock producers. And uh, uh, that's what we're filling on the Board of Animal Health is the position of a livestock producer uh, on the Board of Animal Health. Uh, Dean is the president uh, currently of, of the Board of Animal Health. and. Um, uh, Mr. Comparts, we uh, welcome you to our Senate committee, and uh, we're going to start with you uh, being able to introduce yourself. Uh, tell us uh, about your background and yourself and uh, why you uh, aspire to uh, remain or stay uh, serving on the Board of Animal Health uh, and some of the um, activities you guys participate in there, as well as um, any other aspects that you think are pertinent and helpful for us to know as we um, go through a process of um, reviewing and uh, interviewing and uh, uh, question and answer to uh, to uh, work follow, follow the appointment authority that the Senate exclusively has under the Constitution. And so uh, uh, we welcome you to our committee. We uh, know you've served a long time and we appreciate uh, that and the stability that you bring uh, the aspect of agriculture uh, from your resume is is quite impressive and uh, as well as youth uh, 4-H um, it's very very well rounded and uh, uh, pork, pork family of the year in 2017 and so um, Mr. Comparts with no further ado I'll, I'll let you get started and then members we're going to uh, Dr. Beth Thompson uh, will uh, uh, add comments or, or testify uh, following Mr. Comparts, and then we'll open it up for uh, questions, comments, and uh, uh, any other aspect uh, for this hearing. So, Mr. Comparts, uh, welcome to our committee. I appreciate you taking time uh, away from your farm and away from the Board of Animal Health uh, to uh, talk to our committee. So, welcome. Identify yourself just for the record and uh, anybody listening, and um, you may proceed. Thank you, Senator Westrom. Uh, my name is Dean Compart. I'm from Nicollet, Minnesota. Uh, my family has been involved in a family owned and operated swine breeding stock business since 1949 when my dad started it uh, from, from uh, uh, just a mere couple of pigs. My mother grew up in uh, Anoka County. She raised pigs as well. They met through the Minnesota State Fair through 4-H and uh, we've, uh, that's, that's, that's where it all started from. Uh, I have been uh, uh, very involved and have joined and I have enjoyed the time that I've been on the Minnesota Board of Animal Health. Um, I've, I've always tried to be well read and try to uh, uh, anticipate some of the things that are going on in the world uh, uh, relative to disease and so forth uh, with high path, even influenza, things like that, African swine fever and so forth. And so these are all uh, things that I try to keep myself up up to speed on. Our family was impacted uh, through disease and, and largely our family business has been shaped by disease. 
And not a lot of people probably would be real proud of that, but I guess I'm more proud of how we came out of the disease and what we made from it, uh, a little bit like when Delta Lemon make lemonade. Uh, we contracted swine pseudorabies in 1987. It quarantined our 400 South Farm that four families were living on, and it made Black Monday on Wall Street look like a walk in the park. We, were, uh, um, we went out, we purchased other farms. We did um, cesarean section work where we took animals that we wanted to retain and you continue to utilize as some of our better genetics. And we raised them in, in, in labs. We cross fostered them onto sows that had high health levels that were uh, free of this disease. And so we managed our way around it. We managed our way through it. And I think that's some of the things that make me well qualified to be uh, here on the board. Since that time, pseudorabies has been eradicated. Uh, we had a quality vaccine. We had quality testing. Uh, technology that allowed us to be able to uh, eradicate a disease like that. Um, since that time, we uh, have had our farm impacted through with something known as uh, porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome to a point at our location at Nicollet where we all uh, started or this business was started. We no longer raise breeding stock there. There's just too many other animals or pigs uh, in the area. And because of the aerosol spread of that disease, we've moved our breeding stock uh, operations uh, into the central part of the state where there's fewer pigs. And so uh, another decision we had to make, it wasn't an easy one because we all enjoyed being involved in the breeding stock business, um, but that decision had to be made in order for our uh, operation to continue into the future. We've been able to uh, uh, expand our uh, family business into uh, where we raise pigs that are strictly used for market purposes. And then we market those pigs under Compart Family Farms Premium Duroc Pork Label, where we process between 1,800 and 2,000 pigs a week, where the pork from these Duroc sired pigs, which Duroc is a breed of pigs, that goes into white tablecloth restaurants all over the United States, and we do some exporting as well. Uh, so when um, the pandemic hit, uh, we went from 2,000 pigs a week to less than 200 and uh, it was a tremendous blow, uh, you know, to what we were doing. Uh, and so we we were on the on the front lines of feeling the the impact of a nationwide shutdown. And so we managed our way through and around that as well um, through the time when the um, production or the the harvest facilities were being shut down with COVID nineteen. We had to work our way through and around that. And it was actually probably a disease that we had a, a PERS break in one of our sow farms uh, that devastated it. That was probably actually fortunate because it kept us from having to dispose of pigs and back in our system up. So there was a case where disease probably worked, um, you know, in our favor again. So so it's kind of weird to say, but sometimes things happen uh, in, in that way. So, uh, yes, we've been involved in 4-H work. Uh, have been strong supporters. I've been in the Minnesota Livestock Breeders Organization that puts on the Minnesota State Fair Purple Ribbon 4-H Livestock Auction. I'm on the Auction Finance Committee, and I also do a lot with uh, uh, securing funds for uh, auction animals that these kids get uh, into the auction. And for the most part, they're scholarship dollars that they obtain by having some prize winning animals. And so I put a lot of time you know, into that type of thing as well. So. Uh, so I think maybe that gives maybe more background than maybe uh, you were expecting, but I just felt that it was probably necessary to maybe go into some of that in depth to give you a little bit better background as to, you know, what we've been involved in and how um, I, I might look at disease situations. And, and I, I certainly take them seriously because we've lived them. Very good, Mr. Uh, Comparts. Uh, thank you for that. Um, we'll get to questions in a little bit. Uh, Dean, but uh, uh, Dr. Thompson has joined us. And uh, Dr. Thompson, uh, welcome to our committee. Uh, uh, we'd ask uh, you to uh, offer your uh, comments and, and insight. I know you've worked with the board closely and obviously the president, I hope you're working closely with uh, and, and know well. So uh, we appreciate you uh, being willing to uh, offer some comments to us, uh, uh, taking this uh, Senate only uh, opportunity for appointments, uh, uh, which is a serious uh, 
balance of power in, in the state of Minnesota. And uh, we, we appreciate you taking the time and, and willingness to uh, come. So Dr. Thompson, uh, introduce yourself for the record. You're no stranger to the process here, but uh, welcome and uh, tell us, tell us um, uh, what you can. You're muted, Dr. Thompson. <laughs> yeah, we don't hear you yet. Can you hear me now? Now we can. Now we can. Excellent. Thank That's you, great. Chair Westrom. Welcome. Good good, good morning. And, and uh, just so everyone knows, there is a nice rain coming down in Zambroda right now, too. Um, so, so just very briefly, um, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, uh, I, I pulled up uh, my predecessor's initial letter to Mr. Compart when he was appointed. And I'm going to read you just a couple paragraphs from that letter. Again, this was a letter from Dr. Bill Hartman to uh, Dean Compart. Welcome to the Minnesota Board of Animal Health. We are excited to have you join our board. In 1903, lawmakers recognized the value of protecting the animal agriculture industry in Minnesota, where the Minnesota Livestock Sanitary Board was formed. 100 years later, this organization is now known as the Minnesota Board of Animal Health, but its mission remains the same, to safeguard the animal health in Minnesota. For the past 100 years, the Minnesota Board of Animal Health has been led by a five-member board consisting of producers and veterinarians. It's this structure that has contributed to the many successes the board has seen over the years. Um, Members, uh, I would add to that that as, as executive director of the board today, um, I, I commend and I, I truly appreciate the board members who serve on our board, as Mr. Compart has done, um, those who are willing to roll up their sleeves and, and help the board and our staff and our mission to protect the health of the domestic animals of the state. And with that, uh, Mr. Chair, members, thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Thompson. Um, members, uh, any questions uh, for Mr. Comparts or uh, Dr. Thompson? Um, Dr. Thompson assumedly can, can stay with us. Um, Mr. Mr. Comparts, um, maybe I'll just start it off with, um, I guess, explain, explain to us uh, as president of the, of the board and the time you've been on there. Why don't you walk, can you walk through just um, how often you meet some of the procedures and some of the ways you guys work through uh, hearing about disease and then also deciding how and what's the best way to respond in certain cases. Just give us a, a feel or a walk, uh, a walk in the day of uh, board animal health uh, board members and uh, uh, conduct you, you participate in. Okay, well, the Board of Animal Health, it meets quarterly. And so it's not that we do meet very often. Uh, of course, we, uh, uh, it's in a public setting that we, that we meet. Um, as far as uh, items of business that we discuss and talk about, um, you know, and that's where I have tried to, you know, kind of keep an eye on what's going on out there in the, you know, you know, in the world, you know, particularly with high path avian influenza, as that moves and migrates through the seasonal um, flight of and migration of waterfowl, you know, it, it, it might be in one location and it may be at uh, potential risk to the flight um, areas uh, or the flight ways um, that would affect North America. And so I know at the time of, was it 2000 or the last, the, the, the high path even influenza response that we had what was that, about four or five years ago, uh, I had actually brought up and asked the question if they could talk about it because I was reading that it was impacting Europe. And I remember one of our members of the uh, 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 poultry vets had made the comment he didn't have time to talk about it at that meeting, but that at their next meeting, he would uh, have a presentation on it. And it just happened that was at March 15th then of that year. It would have been in between our meetings. Uh, we were impacted by high path avian influenza uh, here in Minnesota. And so it's it's things like that that we have topics, and I have discussed some topics with Dr. Uh, with Dr. Thompson uh, that we might talk about. Um, it might have to do with, uh, 
you know, what, whatever disease issues that are going on, you know, we've, we've dealt with uh, disease issues that could be strictly dealing with livestock or zoonotic diseases. We've dealt with that, like in the case of, uh, um, Rantasol virus that was, uh, tracked, uh, traced into Minnesota and is a very deadly disease to humans. And so, you know, we talk about lots and lots of different diseases and, and I think it's important to have a strong background and understanding for how disease can work and how it, how it moves. And there's a huge difference between diseases, how diseases do move. And it's important to have an understanding for that. If you take, for example, uh, um, diseases like uh, PERS, I mentioned earlier, can move aerosol. Pseudorabies move through aerosol transmission. You take diseases like African swine fever that moves uh, more slowly. And there's different amounts of testing that you can do and monitoring. Um, you know, you take a disease, for example, like CWD, here's a disease that doesn't manifest itself for one to two years before you see that there's sickness. And now of course that animal can be shedding virus into the environment, into other animals all during that time. And you don't even realize the animal's sick. So, so we do have the ability through uh, technology and testing to be able to um, monitor diseases. Some uh, uh, we have better technology than others, and and uh, some of our technology we have for those particular diseases are are maybe a, a, a sample from a dead animal, like in the case of CWD, and and so it really creates challenges uh, because all diseases uh, uh, function differently um, and so forth based on. Um, you know, the technology that we have to be able to monitor them, so. Thank you, uh, Mr. Comparts. Uh, Senator French, uh, you had a comment or question. I do, and thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and welcome back to the committee, Mr. Compart. Members, it's no secret, Dean Compart is a constituent of mine and one that I'm very proud of. Uh, Compart Farms is one of the larger pork producers in the district, and one of the reasons I feel Mr. Compart is so well qualified to serve in his current role as the chair is his experience. If you listen to the things that we've talked about here just in the last 15 minutes, you can see this man is an expert at diseases, pathogens, and the way we can prevent them. And why do we care? Well, because uh, livestock production is a multi-billion dollar Minnesota industry. So even if all you cared about was money, we have to have people that are qualified to understand these issues and to act on them. And while we've been talking recently about the different animal diseases, um, my favorite example actually comes from the time we didn't have an outbreak. Uh, members may recall that we were talking about money through the state's budget for animal disease preparedness two years ago. And Dean Compart was one of the voices that said, you have to understand how important it is to be ready before trouble strikes. And that struck me. In addition, uh, Minnesota Pork, which obviously is in my district as well, works with the Comparts to talk about preparation like the Veterinarian's Diagnostic Lab, which Mr. Chair, you helped provide funding for and will make us more capable to respond to more outbreaks faster. That is exactly the type of leadership we need on the Board of Animal Health. I don't mind throwing out there that in addition to that, as we work with members of the administration, including the commissioner of DNR and the commissioner of agriculture, as we talk to members of the public, as we talk to consumers, as we talk to other livestock producers, nobody is calling, at least me, saying, hey, there's some problem with the Board of Animal Health. In fact, what we hear is the opposite uh, praise for the work that's been done by the board. And I mean to include you in that as well, Dr. Thompson, thank you for your work. So I think, although this is an informal committee, that if we are able to give our impression, recommendation, whatever it is, Mr. Chair, uh, this is one member of the Senate Agriculture Committee who wants to voice his strong support for confirmation for Dean Compart. And that's uh, because it's not a question of whether every person in Minnesota agrees with every decision that's made by a commissioner. We are never gonna agree with every commissioner, but our job is to figure out when the governor appoints someone to a position, are they qualified? Will they do their best job? And by that standard, I think Dean Compart has earned the support of this committee. And I hope should it come to that, the full Senate. Thanks very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Frentz. Uh, appreciate that insight, uh, especially uh, when it's a constituent in your district. Uh, uh, but it reminds me, uh, anybody that uh, listens to the Ag Report, uh, the Linder Farm Network. Um, once in a while, you'll hear 
uh, advertisements uh, from Comparts Family Farm and uh, uh, connect the dots. This is a family farm that started from a couple of pigs in 1949. Uh, also a, a family that's got a lot of experience as, you, as we hear the testimony. And that's what we want, somebody that can bring that real life experience to the board, uh, bring that practical experience that uh, we as legislators uh, don't all have, but we don't have the time to, to dig into it. But we also hear from constituents and they want fair, objective uh, decision makers that are knowledgeable and uh, you can't get any more knowledgeable than being in the, in the business. And so uh, the board was intentionally set up as I've looked into the background. Uh, we want it to be a very, targeted towards concerns for disease, but uh, for the production of, of agriculture and livestock in our state. And so uh, that's very uh, strong aspects that we want on the board as, as I'm evaluating, as I'm looking over. Um, and I, I, Senator French has said it well, uh, we haven't heard complaints from our constituents about this. Um, but members, other questions, and then I, I I've got a couple more myself, but I'd like to uh, pass it around and uh, get get everybody uh, familiar and answer the questions that you have. Uh, members? Uh, Senator Murphy, then Senator Dames. Senator Murphy, uh, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Westrom, and good morning, Chair Compart. It is nice to see you uh, in the screen, and I hope that in the future we have a chance to actually meet in person. Um, this is my first ever uh, hearing uh, dealing with the confirmation. And I understand that you were appointed again uh, to the Board of Animal Health back in 2020, but your first appointment was 2011. Is that correct? Boy, time goes fast. They didn't think it went that fast, though. So. <laughs> I uh, Go ahead, Mr. Compart. I, I, I guess I don't remember when, when it was that I was actually... Um, voted on it I, that seems like a long time ago 10 years maybe it was I, I, I just I don't recall but uh, it, but like I said time goes quickly thank you mr. chair go ahead Senator thank Murphy uh, I, I raised that uh, chair compart only because I, I bet you've been through this process before uh, I have not um, and so I'm the newbie here between the the two of us so I have just a few questions. Um, and the first really is for the chair of the committee, for Chair Westrom or for your staff. Uh, chair Westrom, uh, the governor appointed uh, Chair uh, Compart on March 16th of 2020. When did the committee come into possession of this document? Uh, Senator uh, Murphy, uh, I, I don't know the exact uh, date, but uh, it would have been a while, a while ago, but uh, uh, Joel or CA, do you have a exact date or time? And Senator Murphy, I don't know how precise you want to know. Yeah, uh, Senator Westrom, it's my understanding um, from the packet that I gave all of our members that it was received by the President of the Senate on March 16th, 2020. Um, okay, very good. Senator Murphy. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, um, Mr. Hansen, and I appreciate that. I have been um, thinking about this all weekend long and uh, find it remarkable that we are holding a informational hearing on a confirmation um, now, you know, nearly a year and a half into uh, this person's term. Uh, and I'm, uh, uh, you know, I'm just pondering right now the, the merits of a, a series of confirmation hearings uh, so late into the administration. So trying to understand uh, our role uh, in doing our advice and consent in general. Um, so I appreciate uh, understanding the time frame. I, I have a couple of questions uh, for the chair or for Dr. Thompson, if if you'll indulge me, uh, Chair Westrom. Go ahead, go ahead, Senator Murphy. Uh, who do you want first, uh, Senator Murphy? Well, I think um, my questions might go to either. So I'll just ask the questions and um, we can we can see where that takes us, Mr. Very Chair. Very good. And uh, just Mr. Comparts and Dr. Thompson, I'll just have you go through the chair. So once she's asked the question, I'll direct it to whoever she's asked to direct it to. So, 
Very good. Go ahead, Senator Murphy. Thank you, um, Chair Westrom and um, uh, Chair Compart. Uh, I uh, appreciate uh, your history and your background uh, and, and uh, understand and really resonate with the idea that we need to focus on the prevention of outbreaks. And in my tenure uh, in the legislature, mostly serving in the House, of course, uh, know about bovine tuberculosis and avian flu, and now we're dealing with um, CWD in another way, all within the jurisdiction of the Board of Animal Health. My background is in nursing, so nursing has uh, a very keen interest in prevention. Uh, and I appreciate um, hearing from Senator France about your interest in that as well. I am curious about um, the staff structure and the resources available to the Board of Animal Health to conduct that important part of your work. Are you well-resourced? Uh, do you have the diversity of staff uh, available to you in order to stay in front of issues that are emerging here in the state of Minnesota? Mr. Comparts? Uh, well, thank you for the question. I, uh, you know, the Board of Animal Health over the years has, uh, particularly as we've gotten into diseases that would be um, federally, with, that the federal government has involvement with, uh, has worked together with USDA and Minnesota people. I remember it in the, during Pseudorabies, that was a joint uh, the boots on the ground for the most part locally was the state, but it was state and federal that will work together. Um, in the case of African swine fever, um, Dr. Thompson probably did better um, answer, but I do know that that particular disease is gonna involve, if it gets very widespread, is gonna involve a tremendous number of, uh, of people because there's gonna need to be testing done um, testing done at a frequency to monitor uh, areas that maybe are healthy but are near sources of infection or and also farms that are positive for it. And once people are around that are going to be limited on where they can go and how long that they will have to be out of, um, out of uh, say, healthy pigs because of the potential for uh, disease transmission and, and so forth. So, uh, in the case of ASF, uh, it, it's going to take an abundance of people. And I know that they've been working on uh, identifying veterinarians that are perhaps going to be more, uh, maybe some small animal people in different areas that can be brought in to be able to do the testing. Because, of course, as you get into ASF, you're starting to talk about a disease that will impact our trade. And other countries will be looking on and they will be expecting that it will be professionals, uh, trained professionals that will be submitting samples. Right now, we're fortunate in the pig business, and I think know the poultry business, that with some diseases, we can submit um, environmental samples or some blood samples for PCR testing. And like today, I was we collected samples in our boar stud that will have results tonight at six o'clock, monitoring PED as well as PERS in our boar stud for the animals that we collected this morning. And so that's the type of stuff we can do as individuals, but some of these other diseases are gonna take people that are gonna be trained and uh, certified veterinarians. And, and so the, the disease will, will to some degree dictate how much of that can be done. So I guess I would uh, maybe turn it over to Dr. Thompson for her comments on some of that as well. Uh, doc, Dr. Thompson, uh, Senator Murphy, is that is that okay to have Dr. Thompson answer part of your question? I think yes, you were Mr. Open. Chair, I, that would be great. Very good, Dr. Thompson. To, to the same question, or if you want her to repeat it, you can. She can do that too. Thank you, thank you, Chair Westrom. I think I understand the question, and and actually, Chair Compart did a, a nice um, overview. So, with a variety of diseases, we do, we being the, the Board of Animal Health, but also USDA is involved as a partner, um, look to um, others other than just board staff to be out there taking samples when we have a uh, disease of high consequence and for ongoing disease surveillance. So, we have uh, poultry testing agents that are trained up every year, uh, and the number of those in, in the state of Minnesota 
um, working as uh, quasi agents of the board, um, taking samples. I think the numbers is, is over a couple hundred. Uh, we also have, uh, you bring up uh, chronic wasting disease. We also started a program about a year and a half ago uh, where we train uh, producers that have uh, cervids to go ahead and take those samples that are sent in when their animals are died or are killed on their farms. And then also with uh, swine now, we are standing up a, a swine testing agent program, and that's going to be a national, we're going to be part of a national program uh, looking forward to, not looking forward, but looking in the future uh, for those foreign animal diseases such as African swine fever and others. And then another point I should make too, uh, Senator Murphy, as you know, uh, this legislative session, we are um, working together now. We have concurrent authority with the Department of Natural Resources over white-tailed deer within the, the board's um, service program. So that is a, a, will be an assistance to us, as we've seen in this past year, uh, with the number of CWD-positive animals and a couple of herds and the movements that were involved. Uh, we're going through the indemnity process right now with USDA on some of those herds. Uh, that will be uh, a great assistance to the Board of Animal Health, that partnership between the Department of Natural Resources and our agency. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and Dr. Thompson. If I Senator could. Murphy, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Dr. Thompson. And I do want to come back to that um, that joint uh, uh, and shared responsibility between uh, the Board of Animal Health and the DNR. Um, as I was reviewing and preparing for the hearing, you know, I understand that the Board of Animal Health has quite a wide mission when you think about uh, breeding companion animals um, uh, across livestock and, of course, then to what we're talking about in terms of survey day. Um, so you have a big mission. And again, I am curious to understand if uh, you, from your perspective and the work that you've done, feel like you have the adequate resources in order to, com to complete that mission uh, and to keep, you know, our herds and animals, uh, the domestic animals that you're referring to, in good health and stay ahead of disease outbreaks. Dr. Thompson. And, and again, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Murphy. To that question, we do have adequate resources. Uh, there is always more work to be done. Um, I can give you a list of priorities that the board has at this point in time, and high on those list of priorities, of course, is the response to chronic wasting disease and preparedness for foreign animal diseases such as African swine fever. Uh, there are also other things that the board can be doing uh, that uh, then fall into lesser priorities, and that's a discussion that we have within our agency on an ongoing basis. Uh, there's always... Senator Murphy, there's always more work in animal health. There's always more work that can be done. Thank you, uh, Dr. Thompson and Mr. Chair, if I may. Senator Murphy, any further questions? I do, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. And uh, I have just two more areas of question um, and for either uh, the chair or for, excuse me, for Chair Compart or for Dr. Thompson. Uh, can you share with us just a little bit about the ways in which you can um, uh, call for help, if you will, from the USDA or from the federal government? Uh, I know in the past we've had their help when we've had uh, outbreaks, and I am curious to know how that, how that happens and how you consider calling for that help. Uh, Dr. Thompson, you want to take that first and then Chair Comparts? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Murphy, uh, if we're talking specifically about a foreign animal disease, um, the call for help is, is uh, hopefully as simple as uh, I make a phone call to our area veterinarian in charge, which is the USDA person veterinarian who is here in Minnesota, and then that request goes up through the system. Um, that request can be for people. Uh, they have teams prepared to respond to a foreign animal disease uh, that, that can also be for equipment or um, other items that would be needed for a foreign animal disease response. So there, the, that is the main avenue is working towards our Minnesota-based um, area veterinarian in charge to make the request up through USDA. Uh, in addition to that, on an ongoing basis, um, the Minnesota Board of Animal Health has what, what's called cooperative agreements 
with USDA. Uh, they're part of our funding. Approximately seven, eight hundred thousand dollars per year uh, comes in from USDA. And since it's a cooperative agreement, uh, the board agrees to do certain things. So. Uh, for example, in poultry, we agreed to do a certain amount of avian influenza testing, surveillance testing, and that testing is then the results are reported up to USDA. This is one opportunity all states have uh, to enter into cooperative agreements. Uh, we have uh, cooperative agreements for surveillance, for traceability, and a number of other items. And then occasionally, and, and we just entered into a cooperative agreement uh, with, uh, with regard to chronic wasting disease, occasionally USDA will have unique opportunities to enter into those agreements too. So the, the conversation between state animal health officials and USDA is ongoing. Um, it's not uncommon. Uh, I probably have two, three conference calls a week that involve USDA. So that, that relationship is good between the states and the federal government, Senator. Chair Comparts, uh, any, uh, some additional comment to uh, Senator Murphy's question? And uh, hey, I guess I probably, uh, I probably don't necessarily have a lot to add to that because that's more of the day-to-day -day workings that, that Dr. Thompson is involved in um, that that as a board member, I don't, I don't, I know those that are going on, but I don't get in necessarily get involved with those. Um, and so I guess I, I think uh, that's pretty much about all I really have to say. I guess I think she did a good job of covering and and addressing the question that you had, uh, Senator Murphy. And, and uh, Chair Comparts, um, it, it makes me think of uh, maybe the more recent uh, biggest outbreak we've had with. Uh, poultry uh, about four years, three, four years ago. Uh, I assume uh, there was federal uh, cooperation and inter interaction in that. Uh, uh, any, any recollection of what you guys worked with then? And maybe that would help shed some insight from the board sure. perspective. What what do you guys, uh, what do you do when you have a big in avian influenza uh, scare coming and all of a sudden it became reality? Well, again, that's probably a Dr. Thompson question to, to know, you know, how the, the order, you know, I, I would guess we're going to get the uh, results from our diagnostic testing lab. And at that point in time, there and being that uh, it does impact trade or potentially could impact trade, or in the case of ASF, then I, uh, the, the federal government would actually have the lead, uh, as I understand it, um, once something like that has been detected and we will work in cooperation with them, as I understand it. But that's, again, that's probably more of a Dr. Thompson, the mechanics of it. Uh, maybe I turn it over to Dr. Thompson. And to that question, and Senator Murphy, I'll come back to you. I just uh, think it's appropriate at this time while we're talking. I'm thinking of, of the, like AF or uh, uh, Af avian influenza. Uh, mm -hmm. There becomes a point where you have to decide for farms to quarantine for for animal interactions or or movement to to stop or be halted temporarily. Sure. Uh, share share a little perspective with us from the board, and then Dr. Thompson, uh, I'd, I'd ask you to kind of ad lib to that uh, stem from Senator sure. Murphy's question. Yeah, like in the case of a, they find disease, and if it was high path avian influenza, they would draw a circle around that particular farm. There would be uh, immediately uh, discussions as to what goes into there and what can go out of there and how that needs to be handled. And then there'll be surveillance done on neighboring facilities and neighboring flocks. And they'll try to determine what the health status of those are in the event that the disease is more uh, rampant in that particular area. And that was something that was similar to in the pseudorabies period of time is, is they would do circle testing around a source of infection and try to get their arms around the level of disease that's in the area. And so that's the very, some of the very first stuff that they will try to do is try to get a feel for the extent uh, of where the disease is at and, uh, and, and just how widespread that it is. And so that that would be some of the very first things that would be done, but it would be a combination of 
um, testing as well as then changing of patterns uh, relative to um, things or fomites that might be able to track the disease around to other farms, feed trucks, uh, say rendering, you know, all these types of things. There's plans that, you know, you have to put into place and education that has to be done with the producers uh, at the time that the initial uh, infection is, is found and, and it will change patterns. It might change that people that are taking care of a flock, for example, or if it's African swine fever, people that take care of that building cannot really leave that facility and leave that, that location because they don't want you going around tracking this around. And so that's some of the measures that have to be taken. And, and, uh, and I, you know, I, you know, Senator Murphy with your background in medicine, uh, you know, you understand how things like that have to be handled to curb the risk or curb the movement of disease. And, uh, and of course, as you deal with aerosol spread uh, diseases, that gets to be really, really challenging, you know, really challenging. So Dr. Thompson, I am, you know, I would defer Very to you. Good. Dr. Thompson, uh, any, any, any other comment on that? And then Senator Murphy, and then we'll come to Senator, go to Senator Dames, then Senator Anderson. Thank you, Chair Westrom. Senator Murphy, is, is there any detail that you wanted me to respond to, um, Mr. Chair, Senator? Uh, Dr. Thompson, Mr. Chair and Dr. Thompson, no, I, I appreciate um, the response from Chair Compart. Uh, and it is uh, in our parlance in nursing, a public health approach, including a little bit of contact tracing, I think, uh, which of course is how we can, you know, detect the spread of a pathogen and contain it, which is important and I think central to the work that you are doing. So I appreciate that. I just have one um, last question and I'm not sure if this is a question for Chair Compart or for Dr. Thompson or if this is for Chair Westrom, but oh, I do know, working. thank you, to, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I understand, uh, one of the last issues resolved in the environment budget bill um, in the finance committee, and I was I was uh, in the committee um, and observing was the idea that we would uh, create a partnership between the Board of Animal Health and the Department of Natural Resources. And having managed an organization, having been the executive director to a president, uh, I, I certainly understand uh, the challenges of uh, organizational management and. I, I think the the dual uh, the dual oversight uh, uh, may prove uh, a couple of things for us. One, uh, that the the tools uh, at the Department of Natural Resources are necessary for the containment of CWD. We might find that out, but we also might find that um, through this political solution um, of giving um, this responsibility jointly to two bodies, at least two bodies. Uh, that we create a uh, further barrier in the pursuit of containing CWD. So uh, because it all happened mostly behind closed doors, the public doesn't really understand what happened. Um, and I'm not clear about how we got to the conclusion about uh, two organizations, two agencies being responsible for now the oversight and containment and management of CWD. Uh, and it may be in the future that the legislature looks back and recognizes that they made an error. Um, I hope that's not the case. Um, we will we will see. Uh, but I would like to know uh, from uh, Chair Compart or Dr. Thompson about um, the next steps in building a functioning relationship with the DNR in pursuit of containing CWD. I, uh, I mentioned to Chair Westrom on my way uh, or as this meeting got started that I spent the weekend with my family, including with Joe, my husband, who has been hunting deer uh, since he was a child, uh, able, you know, to carry with his father. Uh, and he, of course, is, you know, highly concerned, like lots of people are, about the health of our domestic deer herd in Minnesota. Uh, and I know that that is a part of the work uh, of the Board of Animal Health and now with the DNR. So, the work in front of you seems to me to be very important. And I, it would be helpful for me to understand today and then going forward, how you envision that work, how you're gonna build a functioning relationship. Um, and so that you both organizations can bring their tools to bear on this issue. Very good, uh, Senator Murphy. I'm thinking uh, with, with the recent legislation, I know Dr. Thompson, uh, myself, others were involved in that. Uh, I would have her maybe start with that, Senator Murphy, if that's all right, and then Chair Comparts uh, uh, to follow. Um, 
If that's all right, I'll, Dr. Thompson. That's all good, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and, and Senator Murphy, thank you for the question. Uh, this is a, a, a new, a new uh, way to look at a very, very concerning issue that we have here in Minnesota. And uh, first of all, to address the, the um, Department of Natural Resources Board of Animal Health, um, while we have very different, um, what should I say, goals, uh, for each one of those agencies, we do overlap because we have the same species, especially when we talk about white-tailed deer. And this concurrent authority does uh, specifically uh, include white-tailed deer. So we have white-tailed deer behind the fence that are being farmed. We have white-tailed deer herd in Minnesota that, that uh, folks are, are hunting. So the, the process that we're going to be going through, um, Commissioner Stroman and I have been exchanging emails in this past week. Uh, we are going to get together uh, this month uh, for a very high level meeting between the two agencies. So Commissioner Stroman, myself, uh, Assistant Director uh, Linda Glazer from our office, probably a couple others, and start discussing where we're going to be moving with this. Now, DNR and the Board of Animal Health already have somewhat of a structure in place. We have a memorandum of understanding that we entered into uh, within the last couple of years. We continue to update that memorandum of understanding. So we have ongoing um, rela a relationship between the two agencies. Um, I, I get concerned at times when uh, folks talk about the two agencies not getting along. Uh, that certainly isn't the case, at least from my perspective. And I, I think most of the, the staff that we work with with the Board of Animal Health, um, certainly with some of the current issues with CWD, and, and I'm gonna include the, the Beltrami situation, uh, we have uh, ongoing communication. Uh, both of the agencies are working to address that situation. And so I think it's just building out the relationship that we've established, Senator Murphy. Um, I'm looking forward to it because we want to, at least from my perspective as executive director and, and state veterinarian, we want to deal with the chronic wasting disease that Minnesota is, is seeing right now. So if this, this might be the solution, and I'm willing to try anything and everything to actually deal with the situation as we have it, until, and, and Senator, with your background, you understand this little plug, until we have a live animal test. I think that's so important for both farmed and then moving to the, the wild herd also. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Mr. Comparts, do uh, you want to add comment to that? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Chair Westrom and uh, uh, Senator Murphy. I, uh, the, Dr. Thompson touched on the live animal test and uh, that is very, very critical. And I, I understand that there was legislation and funding for the University of Minnesota's uh, uh, lab that's working on that, that approach. Uh, I think the more testing and the more testing technology that we have, the better we can get our arms around this. I could envision that you could do test and removal of uh, uh, animals from a herd potentially. Um, that's kind of some of the stuff that was done in the pseudorabies time. Um, you know, the prion and the, its ability to live, uh, live in the environment creates different challenges than we've had with other diseases. A lot of other diseases, once the animal is gone, um, it doesn't take a lot to get it out of the environment or out of the barn. It's just uh, now we have a CWD that can take incredibly high temperatures, higher temperatures than we even would incinerate carcasses at, um, you know, creates a lot of different challenges than we have with other diseases. And, and to be, you know, we're, we're using and, can, and working with a, a, a post-mortem test is a little bit like leading your dog by the tail. You know, you just don't ever get around to um, to turn to turn it the way you would like to or the way you can with a test that you can use on a live animal um, and something that you could test and maybe a month later come back and retest and know that they've not serial converted. You can feel good about that, and I think that's really important that some of these breakthroughs and that kind of technology will help. It also will help with uh, um, a faster and a, probably a quicker way of being able to test animals for the disease 
like carcasses, the deer carcasses that are harvest hunter harvested carcasses, and and I think some of that kind of stuff can can be big as we move forward into the future, and and so I think funding that was done to support that is really important, and I think there's uh, other states that are trying to do the same thing, are uh, funding that same kind of research. So I think there's going to be a a race um, to that, and I could see that it's going to be a very very uh, lucrative. Uh, situation for whoever comes up with that. Very good, uh, Senator uh, Chair Comparts. Senator Murphy, if that's if that's okay for now, I'll move to uh, Senator Dames. Senator Westrom, uh, thank you, and I want to thank uh, Chair Compart and Dr. Thompson for <clears throat> entertaining my questions. I know that this Chair Compart is a informational hearing about you and your role and a potential confirmation. Uh, but I think it is important for us uh, as a committee to open up uh, the conversation around CWD to make sure that we understand everybody's responsibility here, including uh, the committee uh, and the, the majority's responsibility around this issue. So I appreciate very much uh, your entertaining my questions um, and for spending a little time with me talking about what feels very much like a public health conversation um, and the detective work uh, that needs to happen here in the state of Minnesota to keep the herd safe. Thank you very much for your time, and I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Uh, Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Dean. Welcome to the committee, and thank you very much for taking the time out today to spend with us. We truly do appreciate it, and I certainly appreciate your willingness to serve on the board for the past several years and to continue that position in the, is in the position of the chair. We do appreciate that. I think that it's very important that we have a farmer producer on the board, and I think Dean is an excellent uh, person to be in that position. Uh, I've known the Compart family since way back in the early 60s when I brought some of my first breeding stock for a 4-H or an FFA project from the Compart farm. So those folks have been around a long time. And there's very few breeding farms that have been able to have that kind of success for that many years. So I think we're very fortunate to have Dean on the board and hope that uh, and thank him for that and hope he will continue. And I can tell you this, if uh, this was a uh, official meeting and we were going to take a vote, I would be certainly voting to uh, recommend that uh, Dean be confirmed and sent to the Senate floor. Thank you, Mr. Compart. We appreciate your service. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Dames. Uh, Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Compart, for being part of our discussion this morning. And thank you, Dr. Thompson, for being here. Um, I, I was born and raised in uh, East Bethel, Anoka County. And when you mentioned that your wife was from Anoka County, I uh, wonder what uh, the name of the uh, hog farmer that was in Anoka County that uh, you, uh, you mentioned. Actually, it was my it was my mother. Oh, your mother. My mother, okay. in Gaslin, okay. north okay. of St. Francis. Yeah. Great. Uh, question I have for you, um, Mr. Chair, or Mr. Compart. Uh, you know, we're, get, we're in an age now where <clears throat> a lot of the animal industries is is going to organic. Uh, we're getting uh, people who, who uh, can't have milk with certain additives or things that we would normally vaccinate a cow with. Uh, I'm wondering as we get into, uh, and I, I go to these farmers markets and I see goat and lamb and, and other uh, animals uh, that are basically, they call them grass fed or they don't use any chemicals and feeding them. Uh, do you guys uh, as the animal health board or uh, Dr. Thompson ha have to deal with that, trying to mesh the uh, industry, a uh, hog industry with uh, organic versus say uh, an animal or a farmer that uses uh, chemicals or, or I should say vaccinations for uh, their, their herd. Uh, is there a, a fine line there or do you guys oversee all of them? Mr. Comparts? Um, yeah, as far as um, our involvement with overseeing and being a third party say to, we don't do auditing of anybody that has claims of organic or anything along those lines. That's really a third party um, that is set up to do that type of thing. Um, but we we don't do have any um, involvement in that side of things, and 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 taking uh, following up on those claims and so forth. As far as vaccinating, I'm not sure 
exactly how, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's vaccination that can be done. And that's kind of the approach for some of those uh, organic, uh, they do it through that method as opposed to using any type of antibiotic or therapeutic um, drugs to treat for a disease. Uh, they would uh, first probably rather try to impact the disease, whether it would be say, uh, well, whatever disease that you, you can vaccinate for, they would approach it from a vaccine before they would ever use um, say antibiotics, because typically as you get into those markets, they're typically trying to go towards an antibiotic free uh, scenario. Correct. Uh, maybe, maybe Dr. Thompson has a, a comment on that also, Mr. Chair. Dr. Thompson. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Anderson, uh, the, the comment that I would have is uh, Department of Agriculture has a pretty robust program um, looking at the different types of, um, you know, well, you know, they, they have the whole Minnesota grown and, and the different types of um, oversight on the different, different um, groups, commodity groups and the products. Um, and to that, we, we like to say that the Board of Animal Health takes the animal up to say the, the slaughterhouse door and then Department of Ag takes over after that. So I think, I think Department of Ag would have some, some interesting background on that question. Thank you. Senator Anderson. Well, Mr. Chair, I'm just uh, thinking of the, I have grandkids now who are allergic or who are, have been found to have, uh, uh, when going to the doctor, they've been diagnosed with certain allergic uh, symptoms that relate back to uh, supposedly vaccinations and stuff. And that's uh, my daughter-in-law is taking them to a naturopathic and a doctor and, and they're saying it relates back to vaccinations. And where does that come from? Is it from the, the animal that was vaccinated or from the cows or whatever? And I'm just uh, because we're going into a different kind of a situation and we're almost going back before we had all these vaccinations to where these animals are not being uh, treated uh, with antibiotics or vaccinations. And so it's just uh, something that I would think that along with the Department of Agriculture that the Board of Animal Health would have to be uh, touching base or keeping track of. And this just a comment and, and uh, thought to, to ponder. Thank you. Very good, Senator Anderson. Uh, members, other questions? Uh, Mr. Chair. We, uh, Senator Frentz. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. And I, I want to thank you, Mr. Chair, for having the hearing. Uh, Chair Compar, Dr. Thompson, thanks for your time. Just a couple quick notes. Um, I appreciate Senator Murphy turning our attention to the, the immediate issue, which is how is the state going to respond to CWD? And I'm positive that we're in a better position with Chair Compart in his current role and Dr. Thompson working on it. And as legislators, I hope we keep in mind, it's our duty to work with the various actors, including the commissioner of DNR, the commissioner of agriculture, producers, uh, deer hunters, you know, to work with everybody to get the solution right. Dr. Thompson, I appreciate your tone when you're talking about how this power sharing is going to work. And I'm just pledging to you that this is one legislator, and I think all of us would say the same thing, who will join in trying to get this right over the next weeks and months to try to find the solution that's best for Minnesota. And uh, Mr. Chair, I can't resist pointing in one last Compart plug, since there's a number of them going today, is that I have brought members of the Minnesota Senate to Compart Farms to take a look around and to understand better. And uh, this is one greater Minnesota Senator encouraging my friends on the Metro to come on out, uh, take a look at the way some of this livestock production works, understand its economic role in our state. And I think it'll make some of our work in the Senate and in the legislature as a whole uh, easier for us. And it's fun too. I sent uh, Chair Compart a picture of the bacon my family was cooking Sunday. And I'm just saying, bacon is delicious. That's all I wanna say. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Frentz. Um, and members, uh, as we're, we're coming to a close, um, Senator Murphy touched on it a little bit. Um, many of you have probably seen it in, uh, in the email or the information, um, but Chair Comparts, uh, I know there's been a lot of talk about CWD and uh, Dr. Thompson, uh, the, the response. Um, just a quick question, Senator Compart or uh, Chair Comparts. Uh, Last week, uh, the House all of a sudden dropped a press release out uh, calling for your resignation. Was that something uh, you uh, 
had been consulted about or what, what when when did you find out about that uh, over the CWD um, disease that that uh, uh, is is impacting some some uh, some deer in Minnesota what what when, when did you hear about that or were you aware of that before they released it okay uh, thank you uh, Senator Westrom I was not aware of it at all um, I don't know that I would know very many people that were on the list. Uh, in fact, I really probably don't know more than a couple. Uh, I had, you know, I had no way, I, I had no way of knowing that that was going to happen. Dr. Thompson would have been the person that would have called me, I think around nine o'clock on the morning after it showed up uh, to inform me. I don't surf the internet and things like that, looking for a whole lot of that kind of stuff. And, and so I, yeah, I was caught by surprise. Um, you know, I didn't really quite understand it. People have kind of walked me through, you know, what had happened. I, I honestly didn't know what had been passed in the bill between the negotiations with the House and the Senate that, that would have brought this on uh, to even comment if somebody, you know, what it was that made them, is there something that did not get passed that they wanted? I, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't speak to that because I honestly hadn't followed exactly where the bills were at. Um, and I, I better understand it now that there's been some time for somebody out in the, you know, removed from the process to get that information. But I certainly didn't have any idea that um, it would, that something like that would have triggered uh, that response. Very good. Uh, Mr. Combard, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I just wondered if you had been consulted ahead of time, if uh, all of those people that were listed on there had talked with you and uh, had uh, apparently been told something's, you know, different, that you were you were solely uh, responsible for CWD disease. Um, but I know Dr. Thompson was involved in many of the discussions. Uh, uh, many of them were uh, you know, smaller groups conference uh, chair weber uh, was myself uh, chair ingebrigtsen uh senator or representative or, uh, i know some of the reps in the house were, were part of it but uh, uh members i was concerned like many in the livestock industry uh that this board needs to be unbiased needs to be laser focused on disease of animal health in our state and concerned that uh, the DNR and the Board of Animal Health, uh, while they many times can and should walk, work cooperatively, uh, they, this board is, is, has the veterinarians, has the disease, has the livestock research. And so uh, many deer farmers in this state are just like many other farmers. Uh, that's, that's their uh, livelihood, it's their operation, it's their business, it's um, why we have the Board of Animal Health to keep that safe. Of course, we also have our wild uh, populations, wild turkeys, deer, uh, uh, not wild boar much that I've heard, but some say it might be coming some near someday. But um, so, so that those discussions uh, did, did go on. Uh, many concerned that the DNR's approach to things is uh, sometimes very authoritarian and very uh, different than, than uh, an agency that works with farmers. Uh, but the uh, go end goal is to not put everybody out of business. The end goal is to manage our way through a disease that uh, for the for, for we, what we all know is you have to manage it. You can't stop the spread just because you say you want to stop the spread. Uh, but you have to take precautions. Sometimes you have to figure out where is is the disease. And as Mr. Comparts talked about on his operation and, and others, sometimes you don't even know that the disease is there for days or weeks until the symptoms start showing up. And that's when you have to respond. Veterinarians do that all the time. And so um, this agreement of joint powers has, has been looked at. Uh, Senator Murphy, I just want to share uh, as we looked at that, uh, and, and unfortunately, we've lost a great staff resource in Mr. Kanoff uh, last week or two weeks ago through retirement. But uh, he reminded all of us that back in the going into the turn of the century, uh, 
the DNR uh, used to have this, and many viewed that they weren't doing a good job of it, and so they moved it to the Board of Animal Health. Uh, Dr. Thompson can maybe uh, fill in where, where I'm, any gaps I'm talking about, but my point, bigger point is, uh, we've got to be realistic with what we are asking people to serve and provide uh, service to our livestock uh, producers across the state, but our state as a whole. And uh, there is no magician. The DNR will not be a magician that can all of a sudden stop the spread of a disease. If you uh, believe, don't believe me, then let's just look to their recent five-year track record with AIS and uh, CARP across the state of Minnesota. If they were that big of magicians, they would have stopped AIS with the tens of millions of dollars we've given them. And the reality is they're working hard at it. And they, it's an impossible threshold that you would expect anybody to do. And so I'm rounding this conclusion to uh, uh, express my great disappointment in the how um, the House has taken this action, but uh, members, uh, our forefathers were maybe very, very brilliant. Uh, but if you just look at their press release, uh, it will show you quickly how naive apparently some in the House are to think that Mr. Comparts could stop the spread of CWD alone. And one of the phrases in their uh, press release says specifically, and I quote, if CWD is allowed to spread, condemning the fact that the Board of Animal Health had this and not a full transfer to the DNR, members, they would be setting the DNR up for immense failure if their standard in the House is that you're going to stop the spread of CWD completely. We can mitigate it, we can manage it, and that's what we want to do. But they're so naive to think that the DNR will stop the spread. And let's look to the AIS and how many more lakes have been affected since the DNR has been managing this spread. I think they're doing the best they can. The reality is these natural pathogens, at some point we have to learn more about it. We get more live tests out. The Board of Animal Health has worked on that. Mr. Comparts talked about that. We have U of M that has is on the cusp of it. They say it actually works. They just need more confirmation in the field. Uh, we were some of us were very critical that they didn't use this Beltrami situation. Uh, it went so fast with the DNR depopulating. The DNR, if they were going to help advance the live test, they should have insisted on the test being done on the herd before they depopulated them, so we could get that confirmation done. So, I bring this up not to uh, make more expansive uh, comments than we need, but I, I want to make sure the committee is aware of several of the discussions I've been a part of, several of the recent histories, the recent history that's gone on. And I found last week or two weeks ago, uh, last week, I guess it was, uh, uh, press release by the House to be very naive, knee-jerk, and unrealistic. And so, uh, members, I've been impressed with Mr. Compart's uh, background, experience, and family farm. Senator French, uh, who knows him very well uh, in his district, not just as a constituent, but as a, as a friend, as somebody he intimately is aware of their operation. And so, uh, I think we take this issue very seriously as a Senate. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Comparts is a well-qualified member for the Board of Animal Health appoint, appointment and as chair, and Governor Walls has seen the talents and the skills and the benefits that he can bring to the board um, like Governor Dayton did. It's unfortunate the House made such a rash, unjustified position naively but that is their prerogative too. And so uh, with that, uh, I just wanted to get that background out. Uh, Senator Eakin, I know you've been waiting. Thank you for your comments or, or your, your patience and uh, go ahead, Senator Eakin, members, anybody else? And then I know we got to get this to a close because we have session at 10. Well, 
thank you, uh, Chair Westrom. I appreciate that. And um, I, I just wanted to express my strong support for Chair Compart as well. Um, I feel that especially during this time, uh, his experience is, is uh, very, very valuable when we're now uh, uh, going to be uh, utilizing a, a, a two department approach here in regard to CWD uh, We uh, with the DNR. Uh, we want people who have experience and understanding of how things work. Uh, and, uh, and Mr. Compart uh, obviously has a deep understanding of the, of, of uh, uh, the importance of containing uh, animal diseases um, and uh, firsthand knowledge of this, uh, as well as his, uh, his, his very valuable experience of having been on this board for so many years and, and, uh, and been leading this board. So, uh, so I would strongly encourage members to support uh, uh, Chair Compart. I, I feel very uh, confident that uh, moving forward that this two department approach will work uh, under the leadership of, uh, of, of, of Chair Compart and uh, of, of Dr. Thompson. Um, I think her, her experience and knowledge uh, on these issues is invaluable as well to making this work. Uh, this is an extremely important issue, um, and uh, I don't think we should be you know, switching horses in the middle of the stream here when we're in the middle of this uh, very, very concerning uh, disease uh, that could, uh, could decimate our, our deer population. Uh, we want people in the driver's seat who understand uh, how things work. And so, again, I, I, we need to have clear, I do think that we, moving forward, we do need to make sure that we have clearly defined roles here. Uh, between the departments uh, to avoid any kind of, of confusion or conflict or redundancy uh, and to make sure that things are operating efficiently. But uh, I think that that requires that we uh, confirm uh, uh, Mr. Compart in this role. And uh, I look forward to uh, uh, working uh, with uh, Chair Compart, Dr. Thompson, and others on this issue as we move forward uh, and uh, being in, in consultation as we as we move forward on this issue. So. Uh, thank you, Chair Westrom, and uh, uh, thank you, uh, Chair Compart. Thank you, uh, Dr. Thompson. Thank you, Senator Eakin. Uh, members, any other comments or questions? Having none, uh, Mr. Compart, so I'm just going to make some final conclusion comments. Um, not as long, what, what I just prior, priorly was talking about members. Um, and I know our committee has talked and Mr. Compart, so I, I want you to hear this and Dr. Thompson, and, and I know you do it, uh, but our concern in the Senate uh, with some proposals that have come through uh, is the, the attempt to politicize this committee or, or, or a board of animal health, as opposed to really deal with all of the, the issues from the farmer to the disease to the best way to handle it to come out on the other side stronger and be able to be resilient and mr comparts i appreciate hearing that your own personal family uh involvement and struggle with that 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 is what can happen to farmers i grew up on a farm i know it uh, my brother and i had uh, borrowed money coming out of high school uh, i was actually still in high school to to buy 10 cows, um, red, red beef cows, and um, lo and behold, a couple of them started mysteriously dropping in the pasture. It turns out they had gotten rabies, a very rare disease here in Minnesota. And so uh, <laughs> that, that, that was a concern. And uh, uh, it, it, of course, a loan at the bank that needed to be paid off and your assets are starting to, to, to to die because of the mysterious rabies appearance that apparently had had some skunks in the neighborhood that uh, must have caused it. Uh, the veterinarian was from out east, and it's quite common out east. Lucky she had just moved here to, to diagnose it so quickly. Uh, but those things happen in life, and we want this board to be able to be the best it can be to respond objectively, not be mired down in politics, or uh, uh, have have that become the, the the rule of the day, as opposed to just fair, objective science and best ways to recover and get back to producing a great uh, livestock in our state. 
And so that's why we've coveted this board very carefully to not make changes. Uh, we did add another producer, uh, one from the reservations, as you remember in the uh, May policy bill. But our Senate uh, fought hard to make sure that was a livestock producer and not an activist. And so uh, that was the final conclusion. Uh, Chair Sundin and ourselves, uh, the House Ag Committee came up with this conclusion. And so I, I just share that with you, Chair Sun, uh, uh, Comparts. Um, as you guys proceed, uh, we appreciate your objectiveness. You're looking at the whole picture. And the disease doesn't have a, a pol political agenda behind it. The disease has been around a long time. And we want to mitigate. We want to eradicate. We want to manage the best we can uh, because those diseases do come and go throughout livestock. And I can attest to that as someone who grew up on a dairy farm and raised cattle, pigs, and and uh, beef cows. Uh, it, it, it's it's a unique board we have. And so we appreciate uh, what you guys do and how you handle yourselves. And so, uh, uh, Mr. Comparts, uh, if we were to take a vote, I think you'd fly out of this committee with strong affirmation. And uh, I would, I'm happy to certainly recommend that we confirm your appointment uh, by Governor Walls. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your service to the board. And uh, thank you for bringing your experience to uh, help our state uh, have a strong agriculture committee and a strong agriculture community to feed the state so well and the nation as well. Thank you. I appreciate those comments and the, uh, the support. Very good. Thank you, uh, uh, Chair Comparts, uh, Dr. Thompson, and uh, members. Thank you for taking time. Uh, we've got session shortly. Uh, this uh, informational meeting and uh, review of confirmation uh, will be adjourned. Thank you.